Now, turning our pro to our program, please welcome Jill Palasek, Executive in Residence at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, President Leslie. Mike Nichols, I'll make sure I've got this right. Uh, Mike Nichols is the president of the Badger Institute, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization uh, established in 1987. From 2009 to 2013, uh, he was a senior fellow at the Institute, a syndicated uh, newspaper columnist and communications consultant. A graduate of Boston College and the University of Chicago, Mike is the author of numerous papers and articles, uh, including, oh, they're all basically on public policy. Some examples are an, an analysis of data-driven policing, failures in special education funding and accountability, problems and uh, misspending in the Milwaukee Public Schools Parent Outreach Program, public campaign financing, fraud in the food shares program, the limitation of public subsidies in business, union influences on school boards, problems with discord and lack of productivity on the Wisconsin Supreme Court. There are many other subjects, of course, that he's addressed, uh, all of equal importance and of interest. Mike is also the author of The Awakening, a fiction article, a book, uh, which is a mystery published by HarperCollins, and just recently, just a few sleeps away, a work of nonfiction on the aftermath of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. He spent almost 20 years as the award-winning uh, newspaper reporter and columnist for newspapers in Illinois and our Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, where he wrote about Wisconsin policy, politics, and people. He lives in Milwaukee with his wife and three children, so please join me in welcoming our guest speaker, Mike Nichols. Thank you very much, Jill. Uh, thanks for running through that litany of papers I've written. Some of those, I have to admit, sounded a little boring as I heard them being read back. We're going to talk about taxes today, and I'll, I'll, try, to, I'll try to keep it interesting. But I do want to say that it's a little bit of a cliche, you know, to say, hey, it's great to be among old friends. Today, it's not. I really, um, I really am among old friends here, and I was kind of surprised by it a little bit. Frank Gimble walked up to me, and, uh, Frank, and Frank said, uh, hey, my, my old and great friend, how long have we been friends? 50 years? And I said, well, I would have been about 10, so we're not that, not that old, Frank, but thank you. Actually, it's probably more like 40 years when I was working for Betsy Brenner, who was, uh, and maybe that was before Betsy, you were running the paper, who was sitting behind Frank there. And I used to watch Frank deliver uh, closing arguments in, uh, in federal court. And so uh, I, am, I am really glad to be here. It's really, uh, I, I look around, it's really a very esteemed group, and I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be able to speak here. Before we talk about taxes, I did want to say uh, one other thing about about this group and about how special it is, especially today in America. Uh, and, you know, very, we're in a very uh, divisive, often antagonistic environment and culture. And we're in, a, we're in a spot in America, I think, where civil society is not uh, as valued as it once was. And even sort of what, I guess, what you guys would qualify as is sort of these mediating institutions as the, as the wonks say of civil society. And 
Uh, it just doesn't exist the way that it that it did, you know, years ago. Um, you know, I just see Jim Barry sitting over there. The Bradley Foundation has uh, talked about this a lot too. We really, we at the Badger Institute, Bradley Foundation, we really value civil society. We think that's where where good things happen in the world. And actually, in in our what I'm going to talk about mostly in this this mandate for Madison, which is policy recommendations for a more prosperous Wisconsin. We also had a chapter in there on called for a new civil society, and we had some statistics in there that I was reading this morning. That I'll just read one of them: the share of Americans who have never attended any sort of sort of civic-minded club like this one right here. Uh, increased from about two thirds in the late 1990s to more than three fourths, and this is actually even 10 years ago. So these types of things are becoming more rare in America, and they're and they're just they're so needed. You know, we also wrote that you know these types of institutions foster connections, friendship, participation, dignity, belonging, ultimately the advancement and support that comes from communal bonds, essential in minimizing estrangement. Right and alienation, um, and really essential for development of trust and, and acts of kindness. So I just, I so much appreciate being here, and I, I wish, uh, you know, I, I wish I were more involved, to be quite honest with you, such a wonderful institute, um, or uh, such a wonderful entity. Um, I do want to remind you, though, about the kindness part when it comes time for questions at the end of this. So be kind, because there will be questions. Aaron, Aaron told me I could speak for about 20 minutes and I'm already five, I'm already five minutes in, right? So you're going to hold up your, your, your hand and tell me when I have five minutes left and then we'll, uh, then we'll take, we'll take questions. And I know there's some people in this uh, audience who are uh, pretty pointed with their, with their questions. I hope I don't feel like I'm under cross-examination, Frank. Um, you know, um, we do a lot of things at the Badger Institute. I'm going to flip through this quickly. We used to be the Wisconsin Policy Research Institute for about 35 years. And about five years ago, maybe a little bit more, we rebranded as the Badger Institute. We're still essentially at heart a policy organization. We do white papers. We do journalism. We have lobbyists in Madison. We do events. And essentially, we're, we're a 501c3, so we are a nonprofit. Um, and essentially, at heart, what we try to do is push for policies and understanding and illumination in the state that make us more prosperous and allow for opportunity. We want more opportunity in this state. And that's really, that's really what the whole tax thing is about from our estimation. It's about, it's about creating opportunity for people, right? So we have a, a, a lot of issues that we address. I'll flip through these really quickly. I hope this works, uh, Aaron. Uh, yeah, I already told you about that one. But here are a few things we've done over the years that we've been involved in. And uh, some people, I'm looking around, some people intuitively might not might not agree with some of these. Some people might be shaking their heads. I'd be happy to talk about any of these during the question and answer period, but we were very involved in the passage of right to work, tenure reform, professional licensure reform, prevailing wage reform. Uh, here's one, workforce. This is really a civil society measure. We're not just interested in what happens in Madison, right? We're interested in what, in what happens outside of government. We're interested in, in, in re-entry programs and making sure that people have jobs. So the Badger Institute's been very, very involved in that, and in some other, in some other criminal justice areas as well that I'll, I'll run through here. Uh, they were part of our policy recommendations. We don't just, uh, you know, I don't really like the word think tank, to be honest with you. Um, they, they, that's, I guess, what we are. We're a state-level think tank, but uh, we, we, we like to think we have an impact on things. We don't sit around and, you know, I don't own an ascot. We don't sit around smoking pipes and uh, you know, th thinking about things. We really, we really try to have an impact. Criminal justice, uh, this year, a couple of things we were very involved in. We felt strongly that we needed to get cops back in, in MPS schools. Some folks might disagree with that here. Uh, we didn't, we did a lot of work on that and we do, we're proud to say have police back in MPS schools. Um, this is one that, uh, I think the attorneys and the justices and, uh, and the, the judges, I, I hope, I hope will appreciate and agree with. And, uh, I'm honored, uh, Justice Prasewitz, that you're here, and Judge Wagner. Uh, we, we were very active in pushing for more funding in this last budget for prosecutors and defense attorneys because they were underpaid. And it was really, in, in our estimation, we did a lot of work in this, really having an impact on the justice system because they, they couldn't hold people in those jobs. And, uh, and so it was just causing a lot of delays and a lack of justice. So another thing we were interested in, better schools. I'd say the big thing we've been involved in 
is uh, more funding for parental choice and independent charter schools. We don't, we don't do any of this alone. We were part of a couple of coalitions with a lot of active people. But we do have what I think is probably a guy who I think is probably one of the smartest minds in education in this state, Jim Bender, who's our lobbyist in Madison on this and was very, was very instrumental. We're very involved right now in, in the child care stuff. There are some Republican bills that are going through um, the legislature right now that we think are very important. But let's talk about tax reform. And uh, so, you know, tax reform, if you look at our mandate for Madison, that's the very first chapter in our book because we think it's so essential for, for creating opportunity and really for, really for prosperity. This is a little bit outdated already, but here's our current structure. Uh, as, as you all probably know, four brackets. Actually, the lowest two right there, the 354 and the 465, will are next time you pay your taxes, they'll be lower as a result of the budget, right? Those are going to be 3.5 and and 4.4, or 4.5 and 3, no, 3.5 and 4.4. Those were changed during the budget, and that's the part of the of what was presented by the, by the Joint Finance Committee that was not vetoed by the governor. The upper rates will remain where they are. Uh, as you can see there, the 530 and the 765. So that's where we are. Um, we think that, and as you know from the topic uh, that, you, that I'm discussing today, we think a flat tax it would be very advantageous for the state. And I just, I want to run through why, and then I think we could have a really great discussion and some questions. Um, of course, a lot of people don't like this. Here's just a little bit of the uh, publicity that came out when there was a flat tax that was proposed actually by, on the Senate side by Devin Lemieux, the Senate Majority Leader. He did propose a flat tax. And on the Assembly side, there was something that sort of was would have moved close to a flat tax that was uh, proposed by John Mako and eventually some others um, on the Assembly side. Um, so there was a lot of discussion of a flat tax, you may recall, in the budget. Um, this is what uh, this is the other side of it. This is what Devin Lemon, you said. And the, so you can see this is an old slide, too, because we no longer have Aaron Rodgers around here. Um, neither does New York, I guess. Um, so so there, there are obviously two sides to this. So who is who is right? And I just I want to put this in a little bit of context because I think it's interesting uh, and it will provoke some questions here. Um, State taxes really are only part of the picture. They're only a part. We have, a, we have many, many taxes, local, state, federal, uh, and from all kinds of other taxing jurisdictions. But I just wanted to put this into context. This is from the Tax Foundation. And by the way, you, know, you heard my introduction. Maybe you're wondering, why is there a former journalist up here telling us about taxes? What we do is we bring in the smartest people in the country we can find. We bring them in and we learn how we can do better in Wisconsin. So we partner with the Tax Foundation and we have for years. They're specialists in, in taxation. And so uh, everything that you'll read in our mandate and that I'm talking about today is comes through our partnership with the experts on the national level of the Tax Foundation. We also hire uh, PhD economists, including a guy by the name of Don Bruce, who I'll talk about in a little bit, who did an analysis of the economic impacts of moving to a flat tax. So that's where... Uh, this stuff comes from the Tax Foundation. This is just uh, sort of interesting. It talks about income at various income levels in, uh, in America. And you can see that the top quintile, there, there's a, there is a vast disparity in, in, this, in this country. At the top quintile, it's $7.8 trillion, just in the top fifth. The, lo the lowest quintile is, uh, you know, is $1.4 trillion. Um, whoops, I went the wrong way on that one. No, oh, that's going back. Here we go. Sorry about that. My fault, Aaron. Um, and then the point that I want to leave with here in this beginning is that we do have a very progressive tax system. When you look at it across the board, no matter if, if you know if you don't just look at the tax taxes at the state level, but we have government transfers are progressive at every level. So. When you look at when you consider everything, you can you can see the numbers up there that those are these are average in the bottom quintile. Government transfers to the bottom quintile are I, I can't quite see. I think it's thirty four thousand if I remember correctly, and uh, and then thirteen thousand in the top quintile. So we do have a very progressive uh, tax system, and uh, you know I just throw out one of these stats. Um, you know, at the in the bottom quintile, for every dollar of taxes that folks in the bottom quintile pay, they receive over six dollars from the government. 
Um, these are just the facts. I'm not saying they're either good or bad. I just want to share them with you to put this in context. I'm sure various people here will have various opinions about it. Um, at the upper at the upper level, for every dollar of taxes that's paid at the top quintile, they receive 11 cents. So just to put it in context. So we, with the Tax Foundation, over the past five years, have spent a lot of money and a lot of time putting together two different books on what we think pro-growth tax reform would look like in this state. And why do we need tax reform? Well, partly because we have very mediocre GDP in this state. I won't, I won't run through all the numbers. We have very mediocre business establishment, which is so important for prosperity and opportunity in this state. Uh, we have, we're, we're right in the middle in terms of, of migration. Actually, if it weren't for Illinois and Minnesota, we actually tracked a lot of people from both Illinois and Minnesota because they, they both have a, a variety of, of issues. We would be hemorrhaging people to the rest of the country. Actually, we do lose a lot of people everywhere else in the country. Um, and of course, we have, we're, we're very stagnant in terms of growth, especially among uh, working age, uh, working age folks, which is which is an issue. If you look at our ranking for the business tax climate, our overall rank is 27. We're not the tax hell that all of you have heard that before back in the day. You know, uh, Frank accused me of being around 50 years ago, but 30 years ago we were accused of being a tax hell. We're we're really not any longer, but we are pretty mediocre. We also have incredibly high individual income taxes, which is what we're going to talk about a little bit more. In fact, we have the highest marginal income tax rate between the coasts of anywhere other than Minnesota. And that's detrimental. We think that's detrimental for a variety of reasons. So uh, there have been changes. You've all heard about, you know, uh, and read about changes for years to our tax code. And, and that's true. Uh, you, can, you can read the slide right there. There have been a lot of changes over the past 10 years. But there really haven't been changes at the at the top levels, and I, I can see immediately. I mean, I, I I actually I actually see some skepticism on some faces in the audience. Uh, uh, why do we have to bring down the top the top tax rate? It's not something that a lot of people agree with. It's people who have money, um, but there's a very good reason to bring down those those top rates, and and I'll show you the data on them that that comes from uh, you know the peer reviewed studies, some of which we've commissioned. But the top rate at seven point Six five hasn't been changed in ten years, and we just think it's very important, uh, very important to bring that down. Um, so why now? Well, half the states in America in the last couple of years have brought down that top rate, so we're sitting still. Well, other places, um, many of whom uh, are right around us, are bringing down are bringing down the rates in a variety of ways, including the top rates. Um, we're also at this point, uh, we still have a four billion dollar surplus in this state. And the reality is I like to think we could have tax reform without a big surplus, but politically that's probably not going to happen. Um, and so uh, we are still hopeful that at some point uh, that that surplus can be used to devise a new, a new tax structure, a pro-growth tax structure in this state. So why the flat tax? Um, Aaron, do I have still have 10 minutes here? 10? Okay. Um, why a flat tax? Um, well, that's the way the country's moving, number one. Uh, you know, Arizona, Mississippi, Idaho, Georgia, Iowa, even Iowa moving towards a flat tax. 13 states already have or are implementing a flat tax structure. Another nine have no income taxes at all. There are 15 others that have only a mildly progressive tax system, not progressive like ours, but have top rates that kick in at under $100,000. So we, we really have an unusually, unusually progressive tax system. That is, that is unusual in, in America. And the benefits of moving to a flat tax are, are many. Um, competition uh, being one, uh, simplicity being another, you know, uh, productivity um, being another. And uh, I'll, I'll show you, I'll put some numbers on, on all of that. This is, this is a lot to digest right here, but this is a, a slide in our book. And I do, we do have some of these mandates for Madison that I hope folks will um, we'll take with them and, and maybe read not just on taxes, but education, transportation, criminal justice, all of that. But we put together in last fall four or five options for what we consider to be pro-growth taxation. And some of them were adopted, frankly, on the, in the assembly and the Senate or close to being adopted. And then 
Um, and then the governor, who's got a different perspective on taxes, vetoed, vetoed most of that. And we can talk about what's going on now. I mean, there are other things going on. The assembly passed a new tax uh, plan last week that'll be vetoed. Uh, the Senate uh, overrode the governor's veto, but that's not going to go anywhere because the assembly won't. But this is just kind of back to last fall. Um, I won't go through all the details of this, but we did the analysis on four different or five different, actually, what we think would be pro-growth tax reform options for this state that would be good for everybody um, at different at different levels and um, that we think would have been good. Now, the problem... The problem with totally eliminating the income tax in our estimation, some people talk about that, is it's just unrealistic because we get about, we get 45% of our income at the state level uh, from the individual income tax. So we're not like Florida because like, hey, why come we can't be Florida? Well, Florida, 75% of their income comes from sales taxes. That's not the way. We have, we have very low sales taxes, which is, can be a very good thing, but we're not Florida. You know, we're, we're not places like the Dakotas or Alaska who have great resources natural resources that produce a lot of income at the state level. So we, we don't think that, uh, you know, totally eliminating individual income taxes is, is really realistic. Um, there are ways to do this. I, I won't get too wonky, but this tax foundation in a lot of states has designed tax triggers. So if the revenue is not there, you can kind of rescind or not move as quickly as you would toward a flat tax. Um, so the, the economic implications of a, of a flat rate tax, let me just back up a second before I go to this and then I'll, I'll wrap it up and take some questions. The big thing, the big thing about the individual income tax is, you know, people think, well, oh, this is just trickle down economics. We're just going to give a break to the Bill Gates of the world and hope it trickles down. But that's, that's not really what it is. 95% of businesses, and many of you here probably, I know some of you do own them, are pass-throughs in this state. 95% of businesses are pass-throughs. So they're taxed at the individual rate, not at the business rate. And that money, and I'll show you, that money is reinvested, and there's, there's data behind this, and we, we did some of the analysis. That money is reinvested into companies. It creates jobs. It creates businesses. So we hired a guy by the name of Don Bruce uh, to do this analysis for us. And these are impacts of what would have been a 5.1% flat tax. That would be um, GDP growth of $7.2 in this state over five years. Um, this is investment. I think that's the investment slide. I haven't heard him seeing that. But $614 million, that's business investment. That's, that's basically capital investment that businesses put in when they have more money to reinvest. And 24,000 new jobs. And, and Don was careful to say, you know, we're in kind of a slow growth environment in this state. And, um, and so these impacts would have been a lot greater had we been in uh, more robust economic times. But, uh, but there's data behind it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up because Aaron told me I had five minutes and uh, I'd, I'd rather take questions and we can have a discussion be kind. But, but, but I guess what I, to synopsize it, um, it's not just a flat tax or a progressive tax. We, you have to look at everything within the context of local, state, and federal taxes. And you have to remember, too, that our tax system, even if it were a flat tax, would still be very progressive because we'd still have a sliding scale standard deduction, which you probably all know. We'd still have earned income tax credits. There's still money that flows to the lower uh, strata uh, because of the way things would still be structured with a flat with a flat tax. So, uh, for the, so I think you have to remember that context. You have to remember that it's a benefit not just to the the individual who's making you know four hundred thousand dollars a year because this flows all the way down, um, you know. The reduction in the rates go all the way down. You know, we have our rates go, the second highest rate goes all the way down to $36,000. So um, this is stuff that would help the middle, the middle class all the way right up to the top. But a lot, of the, a lot of the economic impact that we get would not exist unless you bring down those upper rates. It's not a, it's not a politically, um, uh, I guess, popular thing to say, but the reality is that without bringing down those top rates, we're not going to get the economic growth and the opportunity and the prosperity that we need. So 
Um, I appreciate you listening. It's a little bit, it's, uh, it's a little bit wonky. It's super important. Um, we're obviously having an environment right now in Madison where unless a few things happen, we're not going to make a lot of progress on tax reform. But again, we do have a $4 billion surplus. I think we have very smart, well-intended people on both sides of the aisle over there. And um, we're just hopeful that there can be a, a, an ongoing discussion uh, about how we can do better and grow better and uh, enable more prosperity and more opportunity in this state. So um, I would uh, more than welcome, more than welcome questions. Thank you. And as a reminder, please keep your questions concise. You look familiar. I am familiar. I know you, right? I'm Frankie. Yes, hi, John. How are you? Former prosecutor, right? And judge, and judge. Prosecuted the mob way back in the day. Long time ago. Two very closely related questions yes, sir. delivered with, with no commentary. Sure. Almost. Question one. Is there any logic to a corporate tax, which, if you believe in fair mar free markets, is inevitably a regressive tax on consumers, causes corporations to do stupid things, and is endless tax welfare for tax lawyers? Question two is, wouldn't the logical trade-off, if, if you happen to agree, uh, to uh, eliminate the corporate income tax, but then tax any monies flowing out of a corporation into individual pockets, including dividends, at ordinary income rates. We think, thanks, Judge. Um, actually, the most advantageous tax system, all taxes are kind of destructive, especially those that are on productivity, including corporate and individual. Um, and I've, I've learned this over years in dealing with the tax foundation. The, uh, the best taxes for productivity are actually consumption taxes, sales taxes, and there is a regressive element to those as well. But if you're looking long term, that's actually probably the best, most, most productive, most productive tax system we could have. Um, so minimizing, tried hard not to push this off the edge here, Aaron, but um, but yeah, minimizing uh, minimizing corporate and individual both, Judge, um, is uh, is is certainly better than minimizing. Uh, you know, consumption taxes to the to the extent possible. Eliminating the, the corporate tax. Um, I just, uh, you know, so uh, the corporate tax doesn't produce uh, nearly as much as as the individual uh, tax in this state. But I'm just not sure, on a realistic level, we could eliminate corporate and individual income taxes. I mean, we raise uh, it's twenty billion. I'm going to speak out of school here, but we raise twenty billion dollars a year, approximately, at the state level in taxes. I think nine or ten billion of that comes from individual and a chunk of that comes from uh, corporate as well. Uh, thank you for your remarks. Uh, interesting. Brings back memories. I was living through the tax hell as both a reporter and a uh, state employee, so I understand some of the discussions. You did not mention property tax. And uh, at a reception in Madison recently, uh, talking with uh, people that, whose names you'd recognize, there was a sense that uh, there's a building property tax revolt in Wisconsin. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? I uh, actually think that a couple things. Um, property taxes, although people don't like the high rates, are, uh, are uh, probably the most transparent tax. At least we know what they're being used for. Um, so in that way, they're advantageous. I would say we do, they are high. We would like to see um, a different property tax system where property taxes are not used to fund education at the local level. And that's where a lot of your local property taxes go. They go to funding education. We would like to see that severed from education and, uh, and used in a, in a different way, which I think could bring down property taxes. And there are a variety of reasons we'd like to see that, not just for tax reasons, but also to make education dollars more portable in a way that they are not currently. Um, at least that's, the, that's what the lawyers say because of their constitutional prohibitions on how property taxes are used. Where were you a reporter? I, um, I reported for at Times the Milwaukee Journal, WTMJ, Cap Times, and other. Oh, 
Sorry, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> <laughs> Regressiveness is always the big topic. So I, I can't tell from all your uh, slides and things, a lot of numbers there. But what is, if someone is making ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year, are they still paying 5.1%? Under the new regime versus what they're doing now. Well, the new the new regime right now would be three point four or five for those folks. But but uh, again, they have there's a sliding scale standard deduction or earned income tax credit. So I, I'm not I'm not sure what the percentage ends up being. But the, as a result of what happened in joint finance and what the and what the governor did not veto, that lowest rate came down just infinitesimally from like. 3.54 to 3.5 or something like that. Is so I'm not I'm not sure where the percentages work out given all the other things that factor in. Yeah, um, we would like to see a flat tax where everybody pays the same thing. At, at we think uh, neutrality, simplicity, everybody paying the same thing. But that doesn't mean that there wouldn't be some other ways to make it progressive for them. Again, sliding scale. Uh, deduction, standard deduction, and earned income tax credits. So yes, everybody would have the same rate, but there would still be some things that could reduce um, payments at the lowest at the lowest end. Hi, yes, ma'am. Can you just tell me who funds the Badger Institute? Sure, you bet. Um, well, we don't take any government money. Uh, we never have. Um, we. Our biggest donor is actually the Bradley Foundation. Uh, they're very transparent about that. They've been great supporters for many years and we're very thankful to them. We've been around for about 35 years and Bradley's been with us all that time. Um, we raise money from other foundations and individuals who simply believe uh, in what we do. And we don't, take, we don't take money, we don't do contracted research. We don't take money from special interests. We have an independent board. Uh, that uh, along with us on the staff uh, decide where we think we can have some impact and uh, what the issues are where, uh, you know, we think we can help the state. So we're just, uh, we're an odd entity. We're totally independent. Um, we're really, we're not, we're not political. We're not, we're not allowed to be to electioneer or campaign. Uh, so, um, you know, we're, we're active in Madison on those issues that are important to us and we get money from people who simply believe in what we do. And if anybody here wants to contribute to us, you can talk to me. I'm not, I'm not supposed to raise money here. So, but um, yeah, I spend a little bit of time raising money. And Angela does too. She's our vice president of development. Yes. Um, we can't let you go without saying that we would absolutely love for you to um, be part of Rotary. We'd love to have you spend more time with us. So please think about that. Um, Definitely send something, we'll follow up with you, unless you just want to say yes right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd love to come back and speak and talk more about that. <laughs> but I, I, I really I really do appreciate being here. It's uh, And I didn't see anybody fall asleep. I only saw one person nod off, and uh, I didn't call them out. Uh, but, um, you know, it's it's a tough subject. It's kind of wonky, and... Um, and but it's it's important, and I just... I, I just... I, I appreciate it. I know... I, I do know enough of the people in this room to know you know that how much you guys have going on during the day and and really how how influential <laughs> uh you are in this community so i appreciate you taking some time to listen to me and to, um listen to the badger institute and if if you want to see a little bit more of what we do uh badgerinstitute.org so thank you very and much then i also just had one question which is sure. that do you have data on what the you know actual uh tax rate is for the different quintiles i mean if they because like you mentioned there are a ways to make it more progressive on the lower end there are also deductions that are available to wealthier people that might reduce the seven percent that they're paying do we know what they're yeah you know what um I, there are tables they're just they're also they're also different i don't i just i don't i don't have that in my head but i can i can get it for you um kind of i guess it depends on what you know what you're looking at, whether it's quintiles or whatever else. But I'm, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to try not to pull those out of my recesses of my memory. Thanks for being here. Um, the GDP uh, yeah. impact and the cumulative job impact are impressive. 
what are some of the key assumptions that are driving those simulations? Sure. Um, I actually have a paper here for you right here. I've got a copy from Don Bruce. It's a 15-page paper. There's, we've got all of, the, all of the analysis in here, all of the assumptions. Um, I'll just I'll give you this copy. It's pretty, it's pretty wonky, and there are a lot, there are a lot of them. But uh, sure. Um, sure. Let me quote directly from Don. Um, so I mean, well, there are, I don't want to, I don't want people actually to fall asleep, but there are three different things we looked at, which was GDP and investment and employment. So they're all different. They're all different analyses. And, um, you know, the GDP uh, stuff, I mean, there are lots of available uh, estimates that he looks at on income, you know, on impact of income tax rate changes and economic activity based on, you know, a variety of studies that I have, um, estimates of, um, of elasticities and uses of averages. I mean, I've got, I've got stuff on, you know, the average elasticity is 0.57 on GDP changes. I mean, I, you know, again, I mean, we, we hire economists to do this, to talk about, you know, the elasticity issue is a big one, um, but we have their work peer reviewed by other economists. And so, I mean, I'm, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm afraid we're pretty quickly going to get into some wonky stuff, but I'm happy to share with you all of the, all of the analysis, and I can even set you up with Don Bruce. Are you an economist? Yeah. Sorry. Quick. Lawyer. Okay. So, thank you.